podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Now, you're going to hear something slightly odd at the beginning of the Love Tennis podcast today, which is what happens when Calvin tries to catch up on his voicemails during a show. Uh, fortunately, it made him tell us a rather interesting story about Henry Patton and his tennis shoes. So I apologise for the lack of production value, but I don't apologise for the added content. Enjoy. <laughs> Welcome back to the Love Tennis Podcast with me, James Gray, him, Calvin Betton, and the ever-injured George Belshaw, but more on that later. Uh, we've got absolutely loads to get through today. Uh, Emma Raducanu was in action sort of just after we recorded last time, actually. It was a bit of a shame, but we'll look back at that match against Bianca Andreescu. Uh, we'll talk about Denis Shapovalov on and off the court. Stan Vavrinka picked up a win. We we're all delighted to see that. The pay gap in Rome... Uh, Carlos Alcaraz, more complete than the big three, says Justin N. in Arden. I'm sure there will be some opinions on that one. Rafa Nadal's injured again. Novak Djokovic is in great form. Ons Jabour is too. As is Igor Shontek, there's so much to talk about. And the French Open is only a few days away. Um, but we sort of have to start with... Uh... He hasn't got his headphones on, so he can't hear me. Calvin, we can half hear you. <laughs> Sorry. I thought I was muted. Sorry. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, is that your brother? Because like, we couldn't hear what he was saying, but it just sounded like one of your voice notes. Basically, Henry, who I coach, he, there's no grass court. You can't get grass court tennis shoes anywhere in the world mm. at the minute. They're, they're just they're like rocking horse shit. And I'm trying to source a pair of size 13 grass court tennis shoes from anywhere. And here I've got about 15 calls out to here and in the States. And then somebody just sent me a voicemail and that's what I was waiting for. Oh, I but, see. Um, okay. So have you got a pair? No. He's, I don't know. That might be telling me you've got a pair. But, right, um, okay. I didn't get there yet. But no, just can't find any. I've even got one guy who knows a guy who works at the club where John Isner trains at. And he's trying to get. To, to see if John Isner can get some from Fila for me. <laughs> That's amazing. And I said to Henry today, I was like, look, if John Isner can't get a pair of huge grass court tennis shoes, then I'll start thinking there aren't any on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> or John Isner's got them all and he's not sharing. <laughs> this is the problem though, James, because this is what, sorry, I'm delaying things here, but this is how it works like that. There aren't any grass court shoes up for commercial. You can't buy them really anymore. Hmm. So basically what I've found out is I've got contacts at Nike and what have you. They've, there are pairs, but they say we, they've all come out. We've assigned them to the players already. But what they do is they assign players like 15 pairs of shoes. Right. And then come Thursday at Wimbledon, like all the reps are there. You'll start, there's like a, there's a player's area in, in the player's area where they'll start selling off all the grass court shoes that they're not going to use this year. So like <laughs> last year, Luke bought four pair of Nike grass court shoes for 30 quid. Right. Like, it's just and, a fire sale. But I need them before the Thursday of Wimbledon. I need them like about three weeks earlier than that. So I'm basically I'm trying to get in touch with somebody who can get me one of the pairs that they've assigned for a player. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, Calvin Bet on there and his quest for grass court tennis shoes. Um, before we go any further, I'm going to read out a couple of five star reviews that have come in. Thank you very much for leaving them. You can do it on Spotify or you can do it on Apple Podcasts. Um, you can't actually write a review on Spotify, but you can leave us five stars, and that matters just as much. Um, Rev 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 Giz says recently came across this podcast. Love the in-depth, knowledgeable, and informative tennis chat. It's one of my favourites. More BBC Five Live fighting talk humour than Test Match special, but I love the in-depth, behind-the-scenes talk rather than just the journalistic talk. Thank you very much, Rev Giz. Um, the other one is from Dania Thayer. I'm sorry for mispronouncing that. I'm sure I have. Uh, enjoyable and knowledgeable should be the number one tennis podcast. Entertaining banter and great tennis knowledge. But she says. Just please leave politics out of it. No one wants to know your thoughts about Tory or indeed any other politician in any country. Surely tennis has sufficient both on and off court these days. Love the deadpan delivery of Calvin. More of him, please. And George has a schoolboyish good humour. Well, I mean, I would agree with that on a lot of levels, although not good. Uh, while James is an excellent and informative anchor slash host. Love the insights and greatly look forward to each new episode. Ever thought of going bi-weekly? Um, 
yes, we have, Dan Athair, uh, thought of going bi-weekly. Um, unfortunately, most of us have at least one, if not two jobs, <laughs> which uh, makes carving out time to do a second pod uh, a little tricky. But during the Grand, Sl- Grand Slams, we've obviously got the French Open coming up. Um, I'll be doing a few uh, solo pods from Roland Garros, uh, and we'll maybe do uh, a bi-weekly uh, recording during uh, the French Open and we'll, and we'll do loads during Wimbledon as well some quite exciting news potentially coming up uh, about our Wimbledon coverage uh, which of which more in the next couple of weeks but we do have a lot to start to to get through today and um, maybe the place to start and I don't know how much really discussing there is to do but um, late this evening uh, some news came out of the ATP uh, regarding uh, Queens and Eastbourne and the LTA tournaments. Uh, if you remember uh, from the last couple of weeks, uh, the ATP had threatened to pull ranking points from the LTA tournaments based on the fact that they had banned Russian and Belarusian players. Uh, they released a statement uh, this afternoon saying that they had proceeded as normal uh, and decided to offer full ATP ranking points to ATP uh, to Queens and Eastbourne. The LTA's decision to ban Russian and Belarusian athletes is, however, contrary to the ATP rules and undermines the ability of players of any nationality to enter tournaments based on merit and without discrimination, a fundamental principle of the ATP Tour. Sanctions related to the LTA's violation of ATP rules will now be assessed separately under ATP governance. ATP's response to Wimbledon's decision remains under review with more to be communicated in due course. So just to kind of break down what that means is there will be full ATP points at Queen's and Eastbourne and, and obviously all the other um, men's tournaments that are going on uh, in the next couple of weeks on the grass in the UK. Obviously, no word from the WTA yet, but we expect that there will be a united response there. Um, George, am I right to say that perhaps the reason they've not made a decision on Wimbledon yet is that that isn't technically their tournament and that actually it's probably, from a governance perspective, a little bit more complicated to deal with? I love uh, just to start with that you suspect it will be a united front from the WTA. That would be classic tennis <laughs> if they just well, just because the last like the last six months they genuinely have actually worked together. There's a joint app now and everything. But where's the joint statement again on this? I mean, it well, just quite. it's bizarre, isn't it? Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think it's it's quite a funny kind of hearing the noise around what will happen with Wimbledon. I think there seems to be genuinely quite a lot of uncertainty which is unusual normally you get a bit of a, a steer whereas i think we've all heard from different people different things at the minute um so i i, I, sus- I suspect they won't actually get rid of the ranking points of wimbledon i'd genuinely be quite surprised at that the only argument i think that possibly is that would make wimbledon different is the fact there aren't any other kind of tournaments going on at the same time mm. um so so in theory russian and belarusian players can't like you know, go, go to elsewhere. Rosmarlin or yeah. well, I do Rosmarlin later on, isn't it? But you know, they can't. Yeah, they can't go to Germany or France and play tournaments and win points because they're exactly. because specifically to give the Grand Slams proper due prominence, there are no other tournaments, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and you know, it, it, it's quite funny. <laughs> kind of think what effect would Wimbledon have anyway without prize money? Uh, sorry, without ranking points. Obviously, there's still be massive prize money, the prestige. Um, I'm not really sure who it benefits at this stage now just to get rid of the ranking points. I think if you can't put them anywhere else, who's that properly benefiting? Um, it's actually just hurting certain people's careers, um, as we spoke about a little bit with the British player. So I- I'd still be slightly surprised if they actually went through with it now. But yeah, it was kind of worked out quite well for the LTA, I think. I think they must have been genuinely <laughs> pretty concerned at the prospect of losing ranking points. Wimbledon was always going to be okay, but um, the fact they've got away with it kind of scot-free. I know they'll claim there's a little disciplinary process going on and who knows exactly what that'll be. Um, but yeah, well, I think they'll be pretty happy, to be honest. You're quite right, George. Um, the LTA said, we welcome the news that our ATP events this summer will be able to go ahead as planned. Uh, they then it sort of went over old ground in terms of explaining why they made the decision to ban Russian and Belarusian uh, players. They said, we will continue to engage with the ATP and their processes, i.e. the naughty step, uh, over the coming weeks. Calvin, I can only imagine that there's been a reasonably hefty sigh of relief in the British tennis community that, that they've not taken the nuclear option. Um, yeah, I've not spoke to a load of people since it's only come out sort of a couple of hours ago, hasn't it? Um, but... I know the people I have spoke to are, are quite relieved. Yeah, um, there's still a little bit of trepidation as to what they're going to do about Wimbledon. 
I think people don't want to speak. Um, they don't want to speak too soon on that. Um, but yeah, of course, everyone's happy that the 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 main tour and the challenge events are going to carry points. Mm. Um, if only for the British players. Although there was there was talk that even if Wimbledon, even if they don't allow that Wimbledon, they may protect them for another year. Right. Um, I mean, Which, that would make sense, wouldn't it? You know, it would it be unfair would. if Daniel Medvedev to lose his grass court points b- because of what's happened. Yeah, but again, I say this every week and we're not allowed to talk about politics this week. Are we? but, um, <laughs> again, I, I still don't know what's going to happen next year. Yeah. Like, this could still be going on and say that all the time. Also, it's gonna if they do do that, I mean, we're getting into a right spider's web of the rankings there, aren't we? People still have some 2019 COVID points hanging around and... I mean, some... are, th- are there still? Am I right in saying there are still some 2019 points? I think on there Records? are until I think there, in theory, can still be some until June. Unbelievable. Maybe that's quite, um, quite remarkable. <laughs> but that would, I think, that would on, only be the case if you haven't played a tournament since 2019. In which case, you probably in, in that from... in that week, though, right? Because it's overlapping that week. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty yeah. wild. I suppose um, it's inevitable. I mean, you know, what else are you gonna do? There was a global pandemic. I guess the only thing I'd say to um, to George there when he said, who would it benefit? I think the only reason they might not now is they're worried about other tournaments doing it. And they might want to think, right, we'll, we've got to stamp this authority down now that if you do this, this is what's going to happen. Yeah, but, it's um, very easy to see now kind of tournaments following suit, you know, seeing an opportunity to to take a stand, you know, without really any, any repercussions. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's It seems... Well, you know, it, it could have been a lot worse, put it that way. Uh, and it may yet get worse. You know, if Wimbledon loses its ranking points, that will have repercussions and, and it'll be ugly. Um, but it sounds like if I were to put my money on it, I would say they're not going to pull the ranking points from Wimbledon. And I would suspect the WTA are going to play similarly softball. I don't know, but uh, that's the problem. George, as you say, no joint statement suggests that there might be a different statement coming out of the WTA. I don't know. I'd still be quite surprised, to be honest. I think it's probably just more of a case of uh, lack of coordination than any uh, um, serious divergence of views. But it'd be it'd be classic tennis if I'm wrong there. I I mean, it would be classic love tennis podcast if you were wrong as well. Let's face it. (laughs) Uh, Let's move on and talk about some actual tennis, shall we? Emma Raducanu was in action. I mean, last Tuesday now, which feels like 100 years ago, but of course we haven't had a podcast since then because unfortunately we don't go bi-weekly quite yet. Uh, It was a a tricky old draw to come up against a resurgent Bianca Andreescu in the first round in Rome. She was beaten 6-2, 2-1. She walked off, well, she pulled out injured uh, after, well, yeah, 11 fairly one-sided games. I think she only held serve twice maybe in the match. Um, Andreescu sort of smelt blood I think and jumped all over some pretty um, weak serving from Raducanu who had treatment on her lower back as she went off she had a medical timeout. she came back on she was then broken again the second set uh, trainer came back out and then she said enough is enough it's the same injury we saw her get treatment on in Stuttgart and also in Madrid uh, she said afterwards that she had hoped a couple of days off after Madrid would um, make it go away because a lot of other small niggles I've had, they've kind of gone away after taking two days off. I got here, I was training. It just didn't seem to get better. I was training with some limitations. I wasn't moving really. I was just playing where I knew the ball was coming, just staying in one corner. I think I must have underestimated the unpredictability of competition in a match. You have to react. I definitely felt today in a match I was just pushing too hard. George, this doesn't look like a great decision to go and play Rome. I was certainly quite surprised that she did. Yeah, um, it was a pretty flat match. I mean, obviously, she's got this problem which is kind of hampering her. Um, I don't know, as you say, kind of Andreescu really gave the serve treatment. Um, I wouldn't say it was immediately obvious Raducanu had a problem kind of early in the match to me. It just kind of looked like she was getting pasted, to be honest. Um, and I think, you know, if we're taking positives from this match, it was that you know, it was Andreescu kind of back to form and I thought she had a really good tournament. Obviously, took Sviantec to a tie break in the quarterfinals, which is virtually unheard of in the last four months. Um, and then was bageled, which is a lot more common. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think that, that was a, a real positive for the women's game that she seems kind of back in form. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's just 
kind of the Raducanu way this season, isn't it? All very kind of stop start. One week you're feeling kind of slightly positive. You've seen some good signs, and then just I don't know. She's she's always spoken about kind of getting used to the tour, and I I still kind of feel she's not, you know, kind of tour hardened if you like at the minute um you know it's always really hard to kind of comment on players injuries and how serious they are or whatever um but uh, you know I, I get the feeling this this year if nothing else will be a really good year for her to kind of understand where she needs to get to physically mm. um and that that's kind of a very positive way of looking at another kind of disappointing day and hopefully she's you know fit enough for the french open and can kind of uh, turn it around again yeah, I think it's it's important to box clever on the tour. You know, she's talked a lot about sparring and, you know, getting high quality hitting in and the rest of it. But it is important to box clever in tennis because realistically, if you play everything on your schedule, you're going to break down. Like, it's not possible. If you look at the guys who win lots of matches every week, they don't play a lot of tournaments. A Dominic, early stage Dominic team is basically the exception that proves the rule. And, and look at Dominic team now, you know can't barely move and even hit the ball properly so I do think there is something to be said and you know she's got some experience heads around her you take someone like Ian Bates all right he's not necessarily been a full-time coach to many tour pros but he knows the game inside out he's been around a long time and she's got lots of other people around her who know tennis very well they will be learning perhaps that she doesn't know her own body the best. That that seems to me to be the guess from what she said there in the press conference that she thought it would just go away and it didn't. That seems like one of those things where you don't quite know your own body because realistically, she's 19 and she hasn't gone through what she's gone through in the last year ever before. Um, it it can, must be frustrating though, Calvin, to to be trying to play on the tour and to have this opportunity. Let's face it, she's not going to have 2,000 points on her record this time next year. She's not going to win the US Open again. She's not going to be walking into draws as a seeded player. This should have been a real opportunity to to go and pick up some wins, but it just feels like one setback after another. Uh, yeah. Um, we don't we don't know what the injury is. Do we? we know it's back injury, just in inverted commas. So mm. it's hard to tell. She takes a lot of injury timeouts. Mm. Um, that's and. Everything that Emma does is brilliant. <laughs> ah, grumpy <laughs> Calvin a, has really that sounded uh, very sincere, didn't it? Yeah, he's he's. I think he's changed. I think he's. I think he's really changed. <laughs> um, I think what's interesting is that she's she did go and play in Rome. Like I, I genuinely thought she wouldn't because she has had the same injury. Like I mean, Calvin, I I know what you're alluding to like. People take injury timeouts, and sometimes they're very well-timed timeouts, so to speak. Um, I think of Yelena Ostapenko and Benoit Pair as two people particularly good at deploying the injury timeout. But, you know, she, I don't think you can tactically retire. I, I think that, no. that, that's 4D chess if you're tactically retiring. No, yeah. Um, it's a different, yeah, you know, a lot of people do. You know, it's kind of got forgotten now. Andy Murray used to take a lot of tactical injury timeouts mm. um but it's one of those things there's certain people who you don't talk about doing it because they reach a sort of pedestal that you can't pull them off but um yeah You're saying I... you wish you pulled Andy murray off more <laughs> that's not what i'm saying <laughs> um, i get, already get myself in enough trouble on this podcast <laughs> <laughs> saying, saying things that people don't like but um um no yeah no it's it's tough to tell, isn't it? it you know, it's. I, I, listen, I, I do probably have a bit of a pop at her too much, but there's a lot of matches that she's losing that she's not finishing, mm. and I'm not for a minute suggesting that she's not injured. I'm certain she's injured. I'm certain mm. that she couldn't have carried on at Wimbledon, um, and that kind of thing. But for one reason or another, it's. I'm not entirely on board with the. Oh, she's young. She's getting used to the the tour and all this kind of thing. It's it's one of the trappings. And look, every single person on that tour has had to get used to it. Coco Goff's having to get used to the tour. Mm. Schwantek was having to get used to the tour a year ago. That kind of thing. This wasn't happening to them. Mm. Although to be fair, Coco Goff had an absolutely rotten run and still isn't playing her best on tennis. Four, yeah, with form, yeah, in tennis, and there's no question of that. I'm talking about these these physical the physical aspect of it and mm. 
people are different. Look, you know, people people are different. People's bodies mature differently, and that kind of thing. I'm saying I, I, I don't think it's entirely balanced to just be coming out and going. She's getting she's getting used to the body. She's getting used to the talk. And the stuff again. We know my thoughts on saying she's a novice. You don't. You're not a novice if you want a grand slam. I mean, it's quite funny, isn't it? Because it, I, I always think, of, you know, I say, kind of saying you tread a little bit carefully when you talk about players' injuries and stuff. But the, the one that sticks out for me, and maybe this is where the culture's changed a little bit uh, in the last like ten years. But do you remember like Roger Federer like digging out Novak Djokovic for not finishing matches when he was younger and always retiring? The Federer's never retired in a match and it's always been like one of his things that you'll always see through the match um and he, he used to like have a little sly pops at Djokovic who was kind of notoriously retiring uh quite a lot early early in his career um so anyway I'm not saying Radicano is going to become Djokovic but just just to say early retirements as a young uh, professional on tour don't always lead to terrible careers um and also n- always Make sure you never retire could also lead to a good career too. So there's not necessarily a right or wrong way. I mean, Nadal had a bit of a period as well, like not not so long ago, like sort of mid to late period. Nadal had a period where he was like, if he if he wasn't winning, he'd just pull out. There was like I think a year where he he withdrawn from something like like six of the eight matches he'd lost, uh, but he was winning all the others. It wasn't like a period where he was injured. He'd win like four tournaments in between, and then he'd be a set and a breakdown. And he'd just he just pull out mm. before this sort of recent resurgence of Nadal. Um, but I think it was around about when he maybe pulled out against Del Potro in the U.S. Open. Mm-hmm. I think he retired in a um, in a semi against Del Potro, didn't he? I, I mean, I have to say, I was slightly surprised he didn't pull out against. Um... Shapovalov this week, which I know we'll kind of come on to in a bit, but no, let's George segue away. It was so segue, natural. I thought you were going to manage it. Segue um, straight in. Do you want do, um, you want? do you want me to pull the pull the score line out? I mean, I've offered that without having it in front of me, which is pretty stupid. <laughs> but uh, he was uh, Rafa Nadal did lose, as you mentioned, to Denis Shapovalov uh, in Rome. One of the big early casualties, along with Raducanu, um, in his first match in Rome, he lost one six seven five six two to Denis Shapovalov, and as you say, George, he he looked in genuine pain. Yeah, and I was I was kind of going to say that you know Nadal kind of typically in his career knows when to quit when a you can't come back and b when he's trying to kind of preserve his body and with the French Open kind of round the corner didn't seem to me to be that much to gain from that final set so I was kind of slightly surprised he finished. Um, Do you think it's way. possible that? Because so this is the the injury that was hampering on this occasion was the foot injury, right? Which yeah. is something he's had from birth. I think it's called Muller Weiss syndrome. Um, I don't know too much about it. The tissue, it's a tissue issue. It's a soft tissue issue. That's very hard to say. Um, but sounds do you like think... someone who eats too many yogurts to me. <laughs> That's an awful gag. That is absolutely. I, I, I've gotten cocky after that review, claiming I make good jokes. <laughs> no, that's not what she said. Um, <laughs> that's what do, I heard. Do you think it's possible that because he was, you know, dealing with the injury that he's always had, he said, "Well, it's not going to get worse if I play through this." If it had been a different one, he might. But if he knows that injury that well, maybe he's just cut his losses on it and thought, "Well, it's not going to get any worse. Yeah, I might as well keep going." Yeah, I think there was a bit of a degree of that kind of in the. Um, post-match conference it, it was quite an old quote was he when he says i'm not injured i'm living through an injury i'm not a like player that. who is injured i am living yeah. with an injury living that's what with he an said injury. it's um, a bit like saying i'm not a man with a girlfriend i'm a man living with a girlfriend <laughs> um it's, it's just sort of functionally the same thing uh <laughs> very much just semantics um, I don't know, Calvin. Rafa Nadal has been injured his whole career, as far as we can tell. Do you think? He, do, do you have genuine concerns? He's not going to be the same beast at Roland Garros that he usually is. Yeah, I think so. Um, purely because it's look, whenever when anyone starts getting older, the likelihood of the injuries being a bit more serious than they were previously increases. And mm. he's he's had a pretty much an up and down year, apart from the Aussie Open, where. Let's not forget the Aussie Open. He was going in there saying he had no idea how his body was going to hold up. And yeah. I think Federer said that six weeks before the Australian Open, he was talking about he didn't know whether he'd ever play again. Yeah. Um, so he got through that. That was okay. And then he got through Indian okay. Wells. 
<laughs> I mean, yeah, he got through the Australian Open okay. Dropped a few sets, I guess. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Physically. Physically. straight sets. <laughs> Physically, yeah. Um, but then he went to Indian Wells, and there, there was talk in Indian Wells, wasn't there, that everything wasn't right. And then he pulled out of Miami. Yeah. Um, and then since then, it's... I guess since halfway through Indian Wells, he's not been fit, has he? Um, no, no, exactly. Honest. That was where he suffered the the rib injury, where he had a fracture to his rib that um, kept him out for I think forty five days after Indian Wells. Which yeah, and I think you know it's all right. Look, you can go yeah, but it's Roland Garros. It's like it's not Lords. Like it's not <laughs> it's not like it's not like a holy pool of water in there. He's either fit or he isn't when he goes to Roland Garros. Like, it's not. He can't be fit. He can't just be fitter because it's the French Open and it's Paris. He might. He might have. There's an argument that he might be tapering in to that, and he might have known he wasn't fit, but he wanted to get the match practice, and he was not that bothered about withdrawing. But when it turns up to the US, when he turns up to the French Open, he's either going to be fit enough to play or he's not. It won't make a difference what tournament it is. Yeah, I think we spoke a little bit last week about kind of trying to peak for the French Open. And I kind of felt Rome was quite a big week for Nadal, really, where he needed three good matches at least um, under his belt. I mean... <laughs> It is always the case with Rafa that you'd expect him to come through the first three, four matches at the French Open without being scathed at all. Like he'll win a few bagel sets, plenty of breadsticks. It, it, they, they might be long matches, but they won't be like that competitive scoreline wise. Um, so, he, you know, he is capable of playing his way into it. But the way Djokovic is playing, the way Alcaraz is playing, you know, Sissipas and Zverev are getting to finals. I, I really think it's going to be tough from the quarterfinals onwards. And, you know, We'll talk a little bit, I'm sure, about where players are seeded for the French Open a bit closer to the time. Um, but, you know, he's, he's outside the top four seeds. So he could have to come through Djokovic, then an Alcaraz or Sissipas, and then, a you know, one of the other ones. I mean, it, it could be a really, really difficult run for him. And, you know, it could be Dominic Team first round, Stan Vavrinka second. It could all could all be horrible. And Andy Murray making a shock leg burst for the French and playing third round. Tell you what, he'll be hoping he gets Dominic Team first round. <laughs> like, yeah, George is, George is still trying to sell those Dominic Team uh, shares. I've, that seen, he improvements, <laughs> he bought, I've he, seen improvements, Calvin. I've seen improvements. George bought some Dominic Team shares in like October and he thought he'd get a good return on them. That portfolio is not looking good, George, at the moment. Uh, yeah. <laughs> In fairness, Dominic Team is on, I think, a seven-match losing streak. Uh, his latest one coming in Ro- in Geneva, I should say, to Marco Cecchinato. Is he already out of Geneva? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you didn't even know. He's He lost today. Saving himself for next week, James, for that first-round effort with Rafa. Don't worry about it. I, I mean, I wouldn't mind the old tie-break, just, just to give me hope that he's he's got a little bit in the tank. <laughs> so I'll tell you um, what, Stan, Stan looking a lot better, though, wasn't he, last week? Yeah, yes. a great week. Two we two will wins. talk about Stan Wawrinka after this. Now, we've had an email. Remember, you can always get in touch via email at lovetennispod at gmail.com. Uh, it's from Nikos Biggs Kiropoulos, uh, who has been in touch before, of course. Uh, he is a big Katie Bolter fan, um, which uh, I don't think there are many of them. Uh, he's desperate for us to talk about Katie Bolter more. Uh, we will, when she's back from injury. Uh, Calvin, I know you know the Bolter camp well. It's just a, a never-ending kind of cycle at the moment, isn't it? I saw her hitting. She was hitting at Nottingham um, a couple of weeks ago. So she's back hitting and fit, um, I think. I guess it's just match practice now. Um, mm. I would think, as always around this time of year, they're aiming for Wimbledon, I would think. Yeah, I assume with British players, like, yeah, if you, if you have a niggle in like mid May, you just don't take any chances. Um, yeah. I t- I don't know if it's that much. You know, they they're professionals as well. If look, if you're a serious player, then I don't think you'd take that approach. Mm. Um you can't just be taking two months off. Yeah. Um or six <laughs> weeks off because you really want to play Wimbledon. Um But it's not just Wimbledon, right? Like it's all the tournaments that you've got better chances of getting into and you know, the, the more generous wild cards and the rest of it. Yeah. Listen, there are some who I sound like one of those Australian crickets there, don't I? Starting every sentence with listen. Um, <laughs> or look, mate. Or listen. Yeah. Um, no, they, there are some that do it um, without naming names, um, but they shouldn't be doing it. They're professional mm. players. They've got to be playing. They're, you're either fit to play or you're not fit to play. And mm. they've got to be playing when they are. Well, um, 
Nikos suggests, and I think he's got a point, and we'll definitely talk about it more. He says, uh, maybe we could talk about uh, British players specifically seem to have constant injury problems. And I've been suspicious that it could have to do with certain training models. I've edited this slightly uh, to avoid actually actively libeling people. Um, Nikos, I believe, is based in the States where you, you basically can say what you want and just claim the First Amendment. Can't do that here, Nikos get sued uh he says murray has obviously had major injuries but i'm not sure if he has his own team but edmund and robson have had their careers ruined by injuries and others like swan and bolter can't ever seem to stay healthy for long enough and now radicano is struggling with injuries as well even heather watson uh, even heather watson and liam Brody haven't had major injuries that i'm aware of but never and this is a discussion point we go on for a long never came very close to fulfilling the potential they showed as juniors um there's a heck of a lot to talk about there. Maybe uh, when the grass court season kicks off, we'll have a bit more of a, a big picture chat about British tennis, Nikos. Um, he says, anyway, thanks for reading this message. And I look forward to the upcoming episodes. I strongly agree with Calvin about Wimbledon Belarusian ban being ridiculous. It's nice that the podcast and he aren't afraid to be honest. Um, he also says some other things about other podcasts that I'm not going to read out out of respect for my <laughs> professional colleagues. Uh <laughs> But Nikos, you're not the first person to say this to me, and you won't be the last. Um, I'll maybe write you an email in response that I'd appreciate if you didn't share. Um, now, I said we'd talk about Stan Wawrinka, and of course we will, because indeed he had a good run uh, at the Italian Open, which I don't think anyone will have not enjoyed seeing. Uh, first of all, he took out Riley Apelka, who in Venice has played some very decent clay court tennis this year, winning a title over in the States, of course. And he also beat Laszlo Gher, who I think might be on our list of genuine clay quarters um, in the 21st century. Uh, he then uh, had a tricky draw, I would suggest, in the last 16 against the bloke called Novak Djokovic. Yes, 6-2, 6-2 he was beaten. Um, I mean, <laughs> George, I had someone text me saying, I've just woken up and Djokovic Vavrinka is on TV. What year is it? Uh, I imagine you felt somehow similar. <laughs> yeah, I mean... It's really nice to see him back winning again. I think, you know, guys like Team and Vavrinka are, you know, very good for the sport. They've got interesting styles that match up well. They create interesting matches, whoever they're playing against. Um, and they've obviously gone through pretty tough times, you know, more so Vavrinka kind of over a longer period, really. Um, so I, I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying that was his first back to back match wins for a year, possibly. Mm slightly longer I think like maybe yeah. a year and three months or something ridiculous um which is crazy for a guy as good as Vavrinka is um and you know against good opposition Apelka is having a really good year I mean I keep kind of being surprised he's like world number 15 but he he turns up like every week um and he's winning a lot of matches so he's, well, he's got of... to he's got to pay all his hat fines <laughs> <laughs> you've um... got to win a lot of matches if you're going to take a 10 grand <laughs> fine every match <laughs> Uh, and Jer, as you say, you know, that's a good clay court player. And, you know, there was a great first set tie break. I think that was like 10 8 or 11 9 or something. That mm. was pretty tight stuff. Uh, obviously, Novak, a bridge too far. I'm sure we'll discuss Novak shortly um, because we've, we've taken the, the weird approach this week on the pod, haven't we? We're not talking about the winners of the tournament first. That's, that's quite unusual. I, I think it's very, very passe to talk about winners, George. It's not, <laughs> yeah. it's not very we're, we're fashionable. We're plucky Brits, aren't we? <laughs> not, not winners. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you know, Novak's in amazing form at the minute. So two and two against him at the moment, uh, certainly not a disgraceful result. And yeah, I mean, I think, uh, Vavrinka probably, uh, I'll reluctantly put team in the same category as Vavrinka is a uh, very unlikely to win the French Open, but might, might, uh, be a first round to avoid, uh, for those who are seeded, who aren't called Novak Djokovic. Do you know what, uh, Stan Wawrinka's protected ranking is? It's probably quite high. It's like... 22. He's oh. getting into the French Open as a world number 22, effectively, uh, which is quite remarkable. When you consider that Dominic Teams is only 51 um, and Borna Choric is 27, that gives you a bit of uh, context for that. I uh, Protected rankings really confuse me. I've never quite understood exactly how they work, but basically allows you to get injured and then come back somehow. Um uh, interesting quotes, um, and Calvin, I know as, as a man who talks about match practice enough, you, you'll be able to relate to this. Uh, Varenka said after the Jair match, he said, I need these matches, I need the competition. You can't practice that feeling of nerves, stress, the way you feel during the match, the way the body reacts. 
it was a bit up and down, but I finished really strong and I'm happy with that and feeling much better at the end. I suppose when you've been out for a long time and you've forgotten how to win a little bit, that's that's almost doubled, right? That the, the arm must get so much tighter. Yeah, hundred percent. It definitely does. Um I think this is one of the things that always again surprises me about Nadal. He seems to bypass that entirely. Um mm. where other players haven't, even Federer. Remember when Federer came back from his injury last year, he was losing to lose to Bashash Vili, I think. Um and something like that. And um he struggled with it and almost and every other player is affected with it. Djokovic even to be fair, when he came back, he wasn't even injured. He came mm. back in Monte Carlo. He looked really rusty, didn't he? Mm. Um but yeah, it's entirely what that what Stan says. There's there's just no way of you can prepare for it. I guess it's like but I suppose it's like taking a penalty. It's like when people talk about preparing for penalty shootouts by taking penalties. Professional footballers can stick penalties in the top corner all day long. Mm. Whether they can stick the sixth penalty in the top corner, it's sudden death in an FA Cup final is a different matter. Yeah, don't need to remind me. I'm a Liverpool fan. Delighted about how hard penalties are. Um, I think what's interesting and, and what's interesting about Rafa and talking about how Rafa is able to somehow bypass that, what Rafa has, and if you talk to any sports psychologist about him, He's got a very, very strong routine. We, we all know the Rafa routine. I think almost all three of us could probably go and sit on a tennis court now and do the Rafa and fiddle with the water bottles and walk to the back of the court and do all the nose picking and arse picking. Because the bum. Yeah, my mum absolutely hates him for it. She, she won't watch his matches because she's like, well, he's just picking his bum the whole time. It's horrible. But what that is, is it's creating a routine that is the same every time you do it. And so it doesn't matter whether you haven't won a match in two years or whether you're serving for the Wimbledon title. It's the same thing. And and the one thing that your brain really likes is familiarity. And if you can create that familiarity anywhere, then you can pretty much do anything. So I wonder, you know, amateur psychologist James Gray wonders if Rafa Nadal might actually be quite mentally strong. Um, Yeah, not a revelation, I know, but something to think about. George, you mentioned Novak Djokovic and... uh, you almost segued into it. You, you will learn the segue eventually. You've got to lean into it when it presents itself. Uh, he, of There's course... something charming about the awkward segue. <laughs> you don't point to it, George. You don't need to point to it. <laughs> uh, breaking the fourth wall. Oh, don't, honestly. Uh, Novak Djokovic won the title in Rome. He beat, as we mentioned, Stan Wawrinka, Aslan Karatsev, remember him, Felix Auger Aliassime, Kasper Rude, and then Stefanos Tsitsipas, 6 love 7 6 in the final. Is that the most impressive result, George? I, I suppose it is. City Pass is French Open finalist and the rest of it. I, th- I think it's impressive in the sense it kind of had both aspects of what Djokovic will want to kind of impose in terms of his fear factor. It had him absolutely destroying City Pass in the first set, like absolutely mullering him. Um, City Pass, to his credit, then kind of came out second set, mixed up his tactics a little bit. Um, kind of caused a few more problems and then he's serving for the set and Djokovic then shows that kind of uber you're never going to beat me until you actually put that final ball past me and you know breaks him back, wins it Sorry, that's Very a film good. I've not seen George I assume that <laughs> voice was a reference and, <laughs> it's, it's, I, The, the new <laughs> Star Wars budget's really gone down and down <laughs> <laughs> Um but yeah, I mean, all weird voices aside, it was quite a, I think, yeah, kind of a match where you saw both sides of what we were expecting from Djokovic, that he's going to roll a lot of people over in the French Open. And in those times of adversity, he's going to be sharp and kind of hanging in there and making people beat him in the biggest moments. And, you know, I think given Rafa's struggles, he's he's my French Open favourite quite comfortably now. Um you know, people will talk about Alcaraz, but if you're giving Alcaraz or Djokovic over best of five sets in a Grand Slam final, should we go there? It could be a quarter final, could be anything else. Um, I would still back the experienced bloke who's done it 20 times before um, over this wonderful young talent. But long way to go before we get that sort of match. But yeah, I think Djokovic's got to fancy him at the minute. Calvin, before I ask you um, to quantify Novak Djokovic's chances of winning the French Open, I'm going to read you an email from Australia. Uh, Mark has got in touch. He's also known as Dr. Handsome, apparently. He's from Darwin, Australia, which is a heck of a part of the world, I'm told. He says, I'm going to keep this brief 
but quite simply, you guys are hard like a rock. You all together rock. Calvin, <laughs> my girlfriend wants to marry you. She loves your voice. Frankly, I find it quite irritating and quite whingy. Only joking. Love your insights and love how you focus a lot on the tennis coaching side of things. Because remember, without coaches, what are the players? Keep up the good work. <laughs> Much love from Darwin, Australia. I don't I know. That was Calvin who wrote that. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, weirdly, the email address is balvinketon at gmail.com. So. Never heard of him. <laughs> Uh, Calvin, without um, getting too excited about Dr. Hansom's girlfriend flying over from from Darwin to see you, um, how would you quantify Novak Djokovic's chances of winning the French Open? Um, I'd make him slight favourite over Alcaraz now. Slight. Why um, only slight? I mean, you know, Alcaraz has, has never been to that stage of a Grand Slam. Surely. Alcaraz has shown no weakness whatsoever um, <laughs> in the last two or three months. He's... Every challenge that he's had put in front of him, he's met sort of formidably, mm. really. Um, and as I, I've said before, you're never ready until you're ready. So you can say that he's not ready, but who is? Yeah. Djokovic wasn't ready when he won that Australian Open in 2007. Federer, we didn't think, was ready when he won his first Wimbledon. Del Potro, we didn't think, was ready until he won US Open in 2009. They, these players, they win before you think they're ready. And that might not be now. It might be Wimbledon. It might be US Open. But there's nothing to suggest that Djokovic... For me, there's nothing to suggest on this year alone, which I think you've got to put a heavy emphasis on because it's been a strange year, that, that there's anything to, that you would make Djokovic a huge favourite over Alcaraz. Alcaraz has beaten him. Is it harder to be ready when the bloke on the other side of the net is... Novak Djokovic and I think Rafa for, Nadal on the way as well. I think for certain people it is, and I think for such as Zverev and Tsitsipas, it certainly is. They've they've not been ready. They've not been able to beat them. But Alcaraz just looks different, doesn't he? To that, mm. he's not. They they struggle to beat him all the time until much deeper in their career. Then Zverev's actually got his number a little yeah. bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think for Tsitsipas though, you kind of feel like he's kind of missed a, a window here. In, he, since since Djokovic has been out, you you kind of hoped that he would have moved on a little bit, and he hasn't, has he? He just kind of stagnated. Just, it's just you know, I I see on Twitter a lot the amateur tacticians saying, you know, anyone who can exploit Tsitsipas's backhand, um, you know, can just get his number. But it does seem to be the case, you know, Djokovic's defensive backhand is is one of the best in the world, and it seems to be impossible for Tsitsipas to get on top of him because of that. Um, on Alcaraz, a, a good quote flagged by George from Justin Annan, saying, in terms of play, he seems to me more complete than Nadal, Djokovic and Federer. For me, he's a good mix of the three. The comparison for with Nadal for me is not good. It's the precocity of the two that makes them look alike, uh, which uh, I suppose is true. I mean, you know, they were both teenage sensations when they broke through, so that seems about right. I mean, for me, George, he, he plays a lot like Federer kind of really I mean uh, of the three plays a lot more like Federer than the others I think early Federer yeah I mean I think the the forehand is you know that reminds me of kind of Federer in terms of he could like ping it past anyone at really high speed yeah I think it's you know movement wise there's a lot of Djokovic in there I mean he gets everywhere I mean he's Mm. an incredible athlete um you know there's aspects of Rafa you know he seems quite match smart i'd say like in terms of like when he's coming to the net putting things away he's, he, he, but she's right i mean she's i suppose we shouldn't be surprised he's more complete than these guys because he's grown up watching them and seeing what they do well and it's mm. always going to be that way with, with next generations to a degree that, that it's not to say he's going to be as successful as them but you know the guys coming through have been able to watch these three guys and see what's more possible and like kind of develop on that and yeah it's the you know, stretch factor, have changed yeah, they've they've kind of changed the way you know Djokovic. We we'll talk about this, I'm sure, another week. You know, the way he slides on hard courts, and no one's done that before. I mean, that's mm. completely revolutionised the game. So it's no surprise that guys who are coming up, you know, half these guys' age basically, have had a chance to watch them since they've come up develop certain aspects, like the Shapovalov backhand. I always talk about. Yeah. You know, that's a defensive backhand. Roger Federer doesn't have like the big kind of jumping deep one, and that's yeah. because he's been able to watch a weakness of Federer. And improve it. Now, that's not to say he's anywhere better than Federer, but Alcaraz has kind of 
got good aspects of all three, but he is just Alcaraz. You know, he's a fantastic player. It's funny you mentioned Novak sliding on hardcore. I was actually, um, I know Calvin, you disagree with Craig Shannon an awful lot, but he posted some quite handy videos uh, of just just sort of jiffing one shot basically, and just watching Djokovic slide on clay, and kind of just understanding that he doesn't just run to the ball, put his feet flat on the ground, and slide, which I think is what most. And I know we've talked a lot about sliding already, but I think that's what most people would understand sliding to be. But the way he's sliding in different... He's like a skateboarder almost. The way he sort of manoeuvres his feet against the ground to to set his balance in a certain way. No, he is. And I saw those clips that you're talking about. Um, And again, you'll be not not surprised to think that I think that what Craig O'Shaughnessy was saying was a bit disingenuous in that he he was making out that this was a particular technique that Djokovic would use. And it was something about dragging a foot backwards. Yes, exactly. I, I, I think, but this is the problem when you do things like this with just one shot, and you t- you take things like on a still or something like that. You're making out that that that's all he's doing there is showing how that's how he slid on that shot. Mm. That's not how you slide in inverted commas. And and this is the thing with all technique and especially sliding, as I've said this before, when people talk about how do you teach sliding, and it is good, saying it's like a skateboarder is quite quite a good anecdote um there james that i i used to skateboard quite a bit when i was younger and it's all about i uh, see these two guys are both cracking up like when you had long hair <laughs> like, and... that's really thrown me that i don't know if i can cope with calvin the skateboarder <laughs> there wasn't much going on in barnsley in the early <laughs> and of course of course now it's a thriving metropolis yeah yeah <laughs> um yeah i did skateboard quite a bit and i was quite good when i was younger um but and it, and the the whole premise is that it, it's about adaptability and dexterity and adapting to adapting to where your balance is. I suppose you don't learn, for example, you don't learn to skateboard. You you don't have to skateboard lessons. Like you just learn to do it. It's it's one of those things. And and that's like what sliding is. You just find your way around the court. It's not like you can like oh Shannon was making out that this is how you should slide to this shot. You should place your foot here and slide it into this way. That was just one shot. It's how he slid to that one. The next one would have been different to that. It's interesting you raised skateboarding there because I mean obviously slightly d- different sports, but I suppose on a similar theme. I mean Djokovic was kind of a champion skier, wasn't he, when he was younger? You know that's probably kind of yeah. similar themes of like balance yeah. and. Um, that sort of sliding and sinner, yeah, I believe, right. is the same yeah. as well, you know, kind of transferable. Yeah, yeah, no, it would be. It's just being adaptable, and that's what Djokovic is. Uh, and he's the master of it. He's the best ever at adapting. He adapts to situations. Sometimes he needs to serve volley. Sometimes he needs to come into the net more. Sometimes he needs to defend more. The, the ultimate adaptation was he had to adapt to win a Grand Slam final when he was playing absolute dross against Federer. And he did it. Um, he adapted to to the situation. It's mm. what he does. Yeah, we could go on all day about exactly what Novak Djokovic does, and there's plenty of it. But um, there's so much more to talk about. Oh, George, you've got your hand up. I'm sorry. So, uh, uh, can I just check? We're all Djokovic, Alcaraz, then Nadal as our top three French Open favourites. Is that? Is that I the don't order? think Nadal is third favourite. Who's above him? Sissipas. Yeah. Oh, well, Zverev actually, but I just. I don't know. It can't, I think I think it's going to be a kind of classic hot, fast year, or relatively anyway. Um, and I just think that Zverev is better than City Pass. I know City Pass has beaten him twice in the last two in the what in Madrid and then no, did he beat him in Madrid? No, of course he didn't. No, he lost he beat, to him in Madrid and then beat him in Rome. He beat him in Rome, but he also beat him in Monte Carlo. Is that right? City Pass beat. It keeps Zverev it just like trading results though. So yeah. he's got his number. City Pass has got Zverev's number. But I think against other players, I think Zverev is more likely to beat the other players than Zverev is. I mean, let's so, let's uh, sorry, Zverev is more likely to beat the other players than City Pass is. I mean, let's not also forget they're going to be on opposite sides of the draw, so they can only meet each yeah. other in the final because they're three and four in the world. Not not to too, dwell too long on kind of the men's favourites, but how significant is where like Alcaraz and Nadal land in the draw? I mean. We've got like Medvedev kind of kicking around who he returns in Geneva this week, but we all know he's not at the level on clay as he is compared to other surfaces. And it could end up being quite a lopsided draw this if Alcaraz and Nadal somehow end up in the the wrong course. If you end up if you end up, if you end up with like Djokovic, Zverev, 
Nadal and Alcaraz all in the top half, which is entirely possible. Like it's probably only but maybe a fifteen percent chance, which is pretty. It's big, just about right? in the final, isn't it? Really, you'd think yeah. from that position. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to see. Well, it's anyone's game at that point. In fairness, Casper Ruud would fancy his chances if he was in that bottom half. Mm. You know, with Medvedev, Tsitsipas, Rublev, and Orger Aliassim as the big players, you'd absolutely think that Casper Ruud has a chance. I mean, he oh, he's a number eight seed actually because um, which pretty quietly there. Dominic team. <laughs> George, no one's buying your Dominic team <laughs> NFT. Prom- I promise you that right now. It's not happening. Um, can we talk about gender pay gap? Is that sufficiently apolitical? I don't know. Um, it- it's worth mentioning for people who haven't seen this uh, that the equal prize money in tennis that we often talk about doesn't always happen. Uh, there are two events in Rome, believe it or not, although we've talked very little about WC event, but that's because they didn't get as much money. Um the winner of the Rome ATP event took home 836,355 euros and 1,000 points. The winner of the Rome WTA event took home 332,260 euros and 900 points. I mean, it's it's less than half for what is the same event. And actually, where that really starts to pinch, I think, is like the second round where the men get 39,000 euros and the women get 13,000 euros. You know, that is three times as much on the men's side. Um, I think if you're going to have these joint events, and I don't know really how much discussion there is to be had here, if you're going to have these joint events, surely you have equal prize money. Yeah. Yep. There's, yeah, there's exactly. That. That's exactly that's exactly <laughs> the response I was hoping for. Um, because if, if you've got a disagreement, you can let us know on Twitter, at Love Tennis Pod. It's what I'll say, and I'm, I don't have a disagreement. They should have equal prize money. Um, what's a bit different from the Grand Slams, and I, I guess I say this a little quite a bit, is that they're not. It's not the same event in theory. There's a WTA event and there's an ATP event, mm. and the tournament could argue that they're two separate events, and it's up to the WTA to to find the money to pay the players the same as the men's do. In the people in Rome could sort that out. They could they could easily just say we're paying them the same. But it's not like a slam way. It's the US Open. All you, if you go on the ATP WTA scoring app, they're two separate events. Oh, they've the got same. they've got a joint app now, but it's still two separate events. Yeah, that's yeah, it's really annoying. Event. Yeah, yeah, but that that's how they get away with the sep- the the different payments. It shouldn't happen, but that's the that's the in inverted commas logic behind it. It's it's funny. Uh, we kind of say mention that point there as well because um, I think it was the two year anniversary this week of that um, those tweets from Federer and Nadal during lockdown being like, "Hey, wouldn't it be a really good idea if the ATP and WTA merge?" Yes, Roger, I think that's a great idea. Let's all merge <laughs> together, despite saying the complete opposite of that in the past. Um, it's so, looking yeah, closer was... every day, George. I mean, genuinely. The... Well, the W. I mean, the WTA. You know. We've spoken a bit about it before, like their stance on Peng, Peng Shui is like a very good stance and something they should do, but it certainly makes the merger a lot more attractive for the WCA at the minute to actually get that over the line um, mm. financially. So, yeah, I'd certainly say it's closer than ever. Uh, incidentally, since you mentioned Peng Shui, um, the WCA are continuing their stance on holding tournaments in China, i.e. they're not going to, um, just pretty much halfway through our recording last week which why we didn't really mention it uh, a Mexican newspaper broke a story that the uh, Chinese tournament in October was going to move to Guadalajara I think that's the first ever WTA 1000 event in Mexico maybe the first ever WTA 1000 event in Latin America I believe um, which is a, a massive moment it's partly for, uh, off the success of the rearranged end of year finals up in Guadalajara they proved they could do it it's a brilliant stadium court there um, and I think there is a massive tennis watching public in Mexico. It seems what they need really is a a player to get behind. They're obviously lacking a little bit at the moment. I think the Mexican number one is Renata Zarazua. I've almost certainly murdered the pronunciation there, but she's 163 in the world, so they're they're lacking a a leading women's player. But you know that no, you know you, you can't. What's it called? You bring the mountain to Mohammed. That's right. I think that's the phrase I was looking for. If you build it, they will come. I've not seen the film, but feel the dreams. Um, they've also announced a WTA tournament in Tunisia, a 250 tournament in Tunisia, uh, 500, uh, 250, oh, sorry, 250 in Tunisia um, in October as well. 
obviously on Jabour flying. So, it, 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 George, it is exactly what we told them to do. I know, that's astonishing. The people really are listening to our podcast at the minute, aren't uh, they? It's only the important people. You, if you're listening to this podcast, you're an influencer. We we know. We know you're influential people. So um, if you could just pay us to go full-time on the podcast, that'd be ideal. Thanks. I hope my boss doesn't listen to this. Um, <laughs> let's move on, really, Shall I? before I get myself sacked. Iga Shontek won her fifth title in a row, which is scarcely believable, really. Uh, to go from Qatar to Indian Wells to Miami to Stuttgart and now to Rome, which sort of sounds like the world's worst gap year, um, albeit Miami's quite nice. Uh, she beat uh, Ruza, Azarenka, Andreescu, uh, Irina Sabalenka, and Ons Jabeur. No one. Uh, she took what well, she took one tie break. Andreescu, two bagels, two breadsticks, two doubles, a three and a four. I mean, just completely dominant, really. A bit of a shame that the final wasn't more of a contest, George, really. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm sure we'll kind of praise Jabor generally. You know, she's reached back-to-back massive finals. We kind of said last week, it feels like she's taken that step where she feels she belongs and she's, you know, the second most informed player in the WCA Tour at the minute. Um, the slight unfortunate part, as you allude to, is... The first uh, top of the pile is significantly higher than the rest of the tour at the minute. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty tough run to come through. Okay, I know Azarenka is not necessarily the world's greatest clay court player, but she's still a Grand Slam champion. Um, Andreescu, we've said, was finding really good form. That was a really tough first set, and then obviously kind of fell away. Sabalenka, you know, she's she's won big titles on every surface, and she's killed her. Um, and Jabor is a brilliant form in two and two. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the the only thing that we've, we've said this about Sviantec, I think pretty much all of this year is that she just needs to deliver at the French Open. It's really hard to see that not happening at the minute, um, apart from my age old theory about it's really hard when you have an extra day gap between matches that Calvin loves. Um, I can but... tell you something about that, George, um, which is uh, I spoke to Daria Eager's, uh High performance psychologist who who yeah. works in her camp last week, and I, she's I asked, very nice. I've spoken to her before. Yeah, she's great. Um, and uh, she rang me while she was. She, I said, "I'm really appreciate." She literally rang me like an hour after Shontek's semi final. I said, "Oh, like thanks so much for taking the time. Like I really appreciate it." She said, "Oh, it's okay. I'm walking to take my laundry, and it's about twenty minute walk. So you've got me for twenty minutes, uh, which is great." But I, I asked her that exact question. I said, "How do you deal with that?" And she said, "Well." It's really about having active time and inactive time, you know, having time to think and talk about tennis and also having time to, she, she talks a lot about connecting to nature. That She says that's very important in the Shontek camp. Um, there are lots of things she didn't say, you know, she, she is in the end a psychologist and, and there's a lot of confidentiality involved in that. But it was interesting to hear her talk in kind of general terms. Um, and I should say I, I was speaking to her because they're sponsored by ASICS, the trainer company. Um, and they have decided that as part every athlete they sponsor now, they will also pay for mental health support for each of those athletes um, as part of their kind of sponsorship deal, which I think is a really interesting idea. Um, and obviously something, you know, the WCA with their new sponsorship with her logic and um, everything they've been doing with them, it, there's a lot more kind of openness to that um, in the WCA side. But yes, that might be, I mean, I don't know. I think, I think shante has got that sewn up in terms of, dealing with that I've, I've never really seen much vulnerability really not not recently anyway obviously one question who wins the match right now this Sviantec or Ash Barty if she was still playing would we be comfortably backing Sviantec now yeah or... yeah. <sighs> yeah I think so I, yeah, just... Barty never dominated like what Sviantec's doing now yeah yeah it's true I, mean, I think I mean I think I was ahead of points, wasn't she? And she had a few more injuries that maybe stopped her kind of having this sort of run. But... I think I think a fair way of saying it would be that their their top levels, there's not much between them. There's probably nothing between them. But I'd be more confident of Shrontek bringing her nine out of ten, ten out of ten level in every single match than I would be about Barty bringing that level. I I, I do. The more and more I think about Sviantec's loss to Danielle Collins, I think the more annoyed I get. Like <laughs> that, that really should have been the kind of defining match of like the end of the Barty era and the start of the Sviantec era. Like it would have made it, Australian it would have made Open it a final. better walk off into the sunset as well. 
If yeah. if she if she, if you know if Barty had won it in an epic, you know, in a three set in a tie break in the last set, and then just dropped Mike and gone, yeah, see ya, that'll do me. It would have been kind of greater. I genuinely think if Barty played how she did against Collins against Fiontech, she loses two and one. I thought she was like pretty awful in the Australian mm. Open final. Like nerves got completely on top of her. Yeah, she's been um, pretty bad in a lot of the finals she's played. She's terrible in uh, Wimbledon final as well. Ended up winning that. Mm. <laughs> Apart from the, the almost golden set, to be fair, she started quite well. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but I, I... <laughs> I know what you mean, though. Like she, she does have like big dips and kind of, yeah, kind of and moments in fairness, where it feels the, like it gets in her head. That golden set didn't have a lot to do with Ash, but that nearly golden set didn't have a huge amount to Ash Barty. <laughs> Let, let's face it; it was mostly about the girl on the other side of the net. Um, we're running out of time, uh, which is just kind of a testament to how busy this week is. Uh, a few quick hits: Matteo Berrettini. Uh, is out of Roland Garros. He obviously had uh, hand surgery, I think I'm right in saying, uh, earlier in the season. So he's kind of delaying his update. Obviously, the um, grass court season is quite a big deal for him after getting to the final last year. So uh, he's going to delay in order to prioritise that. Uh, similarly, Jack Draper pulled out of French Open qualies, which started today. We're recording this on Monday. Um, I spoke to a few people about that, and he's got a, a minor muscle tweak that I think... Well, he's literally already back on court, as far as I understand it. Um, he just didn't feel he could take the risk and that he might have potentially injured himself more. And obviously, you know, Jack's been been through a fair few injuries, as we all know. So I, I can imagine he's maybe a little bit more cautious than, than he might otherwise be. But he'll be back for the grass. And, yeah, we're excited about what he can do in that. Laura Robson has retired. Now, I think the biggest shock there is that she wasn't already retired. I think most of us thought she had already hung up the racket. Um, she had three hip surgeries uh, overall, the most recent one in January 2021. Uh, I think we all thought when she said she was having the third one just to avoid, just to make sure she was pain-free that that was that, but she felt that she wanted to, to confirm just ahead of the grass court season that she she has in fact retired. Um Calvin, you, you obviously will have seen lots of Laura Robson at various stages. I mean, what did you think she could be? You know, when she won that junior Wimbledon and she looked like a very clean striker of the ball, were you really excited about what she might be? Um, yeah, I saw her first about eight months before that in uh, Denmark at an ITF tournament. Um, and you could see then she was a phenomenal ball striker. Um, and that continued through Wimbledon. There was always a question about how good a mover she was, and I don't think that ever really went away. Um, she was never really a natural athlete, um, but was a, a really good ball striker. But to be fair, over the last 15 years, there's been a lot of female players who weren't great movers, who were really big ball strikers. So that there's no reason why that would have held her back from being one of the top players mm. uh, in the world. I guess there were always questions about how how much she really wanted it. Um, as always in these situations, players, they'll always claim that they do. I'm not saying she didn't. There was just always those questions. Mm. Um, George, she's obviously now going to play a big part of lots of the broadcasting team. She's already been seen on co-coms quite a lot. I've, I've quite enjoyed her as an addition to co-commentary, although it's been suggested to me that's just because she's posh and I am also allegedly <laughs> posh. Uh, can you comment since you're a resident middle class individual? <laughs> um, I, I, I'm kind of in the middle. I, there are very few commentators I would get very excited for, to be honest. I think I we, we maybe could rank them in another week or something. But oh, I'd great. Like, yeah, let's see how many people we can piss off in a week. <laughs> Where would I rank on that, George? <laughs> <laughs> obviously, obviously number two. I, I think my, my number one's probably... Petchy, to be fair, I think he kind of brings an extra kind of technical element and kind of brings that to life really well in real time, which I think is quite a hard skill. Um, so I, I think Hi, he's Patch. probably number one. Um, yeah, I assume you're just playing one. smoke up his ass there, George, because you know he listens. I don't know he listens. To be fair, I just I think he uh, I think he's good, but feel free right. to disagree. No, no, I, I actually completely agree. Um, and I know that Calvin will hate hearing it because he knows his, his mates with Petch and wouldn't possibly like to give him too many compliments. But Petch is the best. Petch is the best tennis commentator. There's, yeah. there's no doubt about it. 
Yeah. But he doesn't have a catchphrase, Calvin. You know, you never no, hear him say, that's good, wow. Though. He's, he's, he's not desperate. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, he's not, he doesn't have one like that, and he's not desperately trying to find himself a catchphrase like Robbie Koenig is in every <laughs> sentence he comments. Oh, good, yeah. We're taking names now. I wonder how long it would take um, us to get I, I, I love Robbie as well. He's a lovely player. <laughs> so I'm, I, I wouldn't say anything bad about, about Robbie. <laughs> Really? Yeah, I've got some that, WhatsApps that might suggest otherwise. The best thing is that neither of them talk constantly like Greg Rosetsky does. <laughs> very much works on a quantity over quality basis. <laughs> there's, there's no need to do that episode ranking them now. We've achieved our own of annoying yeah. everyone in the industry. Yeah, yeah, Laura, yeah, Laura's quite good though. Like, yeah. It's a bit posh, yeah. but... I think that's important. I think we need more representation of posh. No, I don't generally do <laughs> But... Um, there are a few things I've got on my schedule uh, that I wanted to talk about um, that we're not going to have time to talk about. Is Diego Schwartzman and John Isner the best doubles pairing in tennis? Yes, is the answer. Um, the photos of them look just completely absurd. Uh, they played together in Rome this week. They also played together in India Wells. They got to the final in Rome, though, only losing to Mektic and Pavic. But that maybe wasn't the best story and one you might have missed uh, from the doubles in Rome uh, Harry Heliovara and Lloyd Glasspool, who of course are friends of the pod, I assume, unless Calvin doesn't like the way they commentate, um, they scrambled across Europe to get into Rome uh, as alternates because of a late pullout. Um, I mean, really was sort of rat race stuff, if anyone remembers that 1990s film. They promptly turned up and beat Joe Salisbury and Rajiv Ram, the world's number one pair, 7 6 6 3. Uh, they got through to the quarterfinal and then lost to the mighty Schwartzman and Isner, which, you know, there's no shame in that. But I imagine that kind of thing happens all the time, Calvin, does it? The, it happens a lot more than you'd think. And it's just, that's why the doubles tour is just absolute madness. You, get, <laughs> you think you wouldn't want, you, you're, you'll arrive at an airport in one city. And I've seen this happen. You'll arrive at an airport in one city, get off the plane to be told that you've got into a tournament in another city and have to book yourself a flight and go straight to that other city from the airport that you're currently at. It's, they, they really should find a better way of doing it. It's just absolute nonsense. But, um, yeah, I, I I didn't see the match. I'd like to have seen it because the British double system would have been at play there. And for anyone who knows anything about what Louis Kaye teaches, every ev everything in the system has an antidote. So how what you do if somebody else plays the system. So <laughs> it would have just been this circular motion of antidote and system in that match, I would think. Fascinating watch, I'm sure. Um, well, we really are just about out of time this week. There are one or two very last-minute things that we need to mention. Um, Gail Monfils pulling out of the French Open. Uh, really sad. Someone who's always a highlight to go and watch on court there because the French crowd get behind him so much. Um, I know that his uh, wife, Alina Svitolina, or Monfils as she's known in personal life, has also just announced that she's pregnant. So congratulations to both of them. But commiserations to Gail <laughs> who will also now miss the uh, French Open. I should also mention Sonny Cartel, um, a real rising star of British tennis. She's won another 25k uh, in Newcastle this week. She beat Joanna Garland in the final 6-3, 6-1. Uh, she really is just flying at the moment. She's into the top 300. She started the year around 800 and her goal, <laughs> she said her goal was just to get into the top 500. So brilliant that she's managed that already. Um, Billy Harris, another Britain, actually a local lad, a Nottingham lad, uh, won the uh, men's event in Nottingham. So congratulations to him as well. Uh, thank you very much for listening. As always, please do leave us a rating or a review if you're able to. We really do appreciate them. And I do try and get through them and make sure that I read them out. Otherwise, stay safe and please do come back next week. Podcast Network.